coin was lying almost at the bottom. So this is the object. Let's consider this is the bottom. No problem. So u is our real depth. Now, mu2 is the refractive index of the water. Mu1 is the refractive index of air. Now, if you want to observe it from this point, let's say this is your eye and you want to observe this from this point. I can take two different rays, right? One ray I'll take as a normal incidence, which is coming normally. So without deviation, okay? It just goes like this, okay? The second one goes to this point. This is the normal, okay? And it bends away from the normal. Obviously it has to bend away from the normal. Why? Because the light is now traveling from the object to the observer. The object is in a optically denser medium. So when light travels from denser medium to rarer medium, what happens? The light bends away from the normal. So as this light bend away from the normal, where do we feel that the two rays are meeting? So if you look at the first medium that is air, so this is our air, if you look at the two refracted rays, if you see them, they're diverging, isn't it? So they're not going to meet. So your eyes are going to perceive as if these two rays are meeting somewhere here. So what you're going to get is the image of the coin at this point. So the coin actually appears to be raised. Understand everything what has happened, okay? So we had a coin and we dropped it in water and we want to see it from the air. Now, obviously this coin is going to sink in the bottom, right? So when you're looking at it, I took two rays. One is the normal incidence. Of course, the normal incidence is not going to be deviated at all. I have taught you all this in the last session. And the second one, I just take a general ray, another ray, okay? So when you see this ray, this is going to be what? Angle of incidence. And this is going to be what? Angle of refraction. Okay. Now, if this is the angle of incidence and this is the angle of refraction, and if I'm talking about these two lines, so this is one normal and this is along the normal itself. Okay. If this is angle of incidence, this is also angle of incidence. Why? Two parallel lines, two parallel lines. This is one parallel line. This is another parallel line. And you have a transversal. These are two parallel lines and you have a transversal. So if this angle is theta, you know that this angle is also going to be equal to theta. Interior alternate angles. Correct. Very easy. Very simple. No problem. Okay. If this angle is going to be R, then this angle is also going to be equal to R. By the same logic. You see, two parallel lines, one normal, another normal. And this is how your reflected ray is going like this, something like this, right? We have extended it, of course. This is how. So if this angle is equal to R, then this angle is also equal to R. We know this, some basic concept of parallel lines, some very basic concepts of parallel lines. Okay, so now we know this. Let's say that this length is equal to x. Let's say that this length is equal to x. Okay. Now this is the image. This is the image of the coin where it is appearing. So where it appears, that is actually the apparent depth, which means this distance. We can call it as image distance or v. So this will be v. No problem. Clear with the angles. Clear with the phenomena that is going on. So you have a coin. You drop this coin, the coin goes at the bottom. Now we are considering two rays. One ray is just the normal incidence, so it's just going like that. Another ray, I'm just considering another one. This is the angle of incidence. Since this ray is moving from a denser medium to a rarer medium, it is going to bend away from the normal, okay? So this is our angle of incidence. This is our angle of refraction. Now, I know that if this angle is theta, then this angle is also equal to theta. Try looking at this and the situation that we have with incident, angle of incidence. So if this angle is I, this angle is also equal to I because there are two normals. The two normals are parallel to each other. 
right? And this line is a transversal. So interior alternate angles, right? Okay. Now, next thing what we told is that look at the angle of refraction. When you look at the angle of refraction, you have one parallel line, another parallel line. If this is equal to R, then this angle is also going to be equal to R. And let us say the distance between the two rays is equal to X. Now we know that the point of intersection of the refracted rays is where we are going to get the image, right? The point of intersection of the refracted rays is where we are going to get the image. Now if I look at in this medium that is air, both of these rays are diverging. So they're not going to meet, right? So if I extend it backwards, I see that the image is formed somewhere over here. And I say that the depth of this image from the surface, I'm calling it as V. No problem. No problem. Okay, easy. Okay. Let's see this properly that how it is happening. So this is your I, these are the rays. And you know that this angle is I, this angle will also be equal to I. This is R, this is also equal. Now, you know that U can be called as the object distance and V can be called as the image distance. Okay. So the actual depth is U and it is also called as the real depth. Okay. So it is actually where? It is actually at a distance of U from the surface. U from the surface. That is very, very important. Or the interface. Okay. And what is V? V can be called as the image distance or the apparent depth. At what depth does it appear? From where? From the surface. From the surface is very, very important, my dear child. It's very important. Okay. All the things that we are measuring is from the surface only. Now, what I can say for these two things, I can apply Snell's law. I can apply Snell's law. So, according to Snell's law, mu times of sine theta shall be equal to constant. We know that, right? Mu into sine theta should be equal to constant. So mu 2 into sine i is equal to mu 1 to sine r. Okay. Mu 2 into sine i is equal to, so mu 2 into sine i is equal to mu 1 times sine r. Mu into sine theta is constant. We studied it this last session itself in great detail. We had solved so many problems. So there should not be any confusion on how I wrote this. Okay. Now, what we are saying is that these rays are very, very close to each other. Very close to each other. Which means these are paraaxial rays. These are what type of rays? Paraaxial rays. Okay. So if these are paraaxial rays, for small angles, can I say that for small angles, sine theta can be approximately taken equal to theta, can be approximately taken equal to tan theta. Yes. For small angles, I can say that sine theta is equal to theta is equal to tan theta. Right. And we are talking only about paraaxial rays. So remember this, whenever you are applying the formula, remember that what we have taken. Okay. Now you see what happens. I can write this as mu2 times tan i that is given that i and r are very small. Okay, i and r are very small. So mu2 into tan i is equal to mu1 into tan r. Okay. Now how do we get the value of tan i and tan r? Let's look at this large triangle. This large triangle where you had this as x. This distance is u. And this is the triangle and this angle is i. What can you write for tan i? Tan i will certainly be equal to x by u, p by b. This is certainly 90 degree because this line itself is a normal. As we told that this is going to be a normal incidence. Are you following it up? Very simple. I'm looking at this big triangle, okay? And I have drawn it over here. So what I can write? I can write mu2 times tan i will be what? x upon u, where this u is nothing but the real depth the real depth, right? Okay, so x upon u, no problem. This is equal to mu1 times tan r. Now look at this small triangle. Look at this triangle. So this triangle, if I draw it, this is x and this is r and this is v, right? 
So tan r is going to be equal to x by v. So this is equal to x by v. No problem. Now x, x gets cancelled out. What you get as a simple expression? Mu2 by mu1 is equal to u by v. Mu2 by mu1 is equal to u by v. That is equal to real depth by apparent depth. Did you get this? Easy? Yes? Sorted? No problem. But conditions you must remember. This is true only for paraxial rays. Only then you can have this assumption that you are as assuming that sine theta is approximately equal to tan theta. Only then this is correct. Okay, so don't forget that assumption. And when we are talking about real depth and apparent depth, in general, if nothing extraordinary is mentioned in the question, we'll take this into assumption. No problem. Okay, all right. Let's see how we got this one more time. So I'm sure all of you have written it down, all of you have done it yourself, and all of you go on deriving along with me. So what we have understood u is the distance of the object from the free surface. V is the distance of the image from the free surface. This is very, very important. From where are you calculating? From where are you measuring things? Distance always being measured from the interface or from the free surface. Now from Snell's law, very easy to write. Mu2 sin i is equal to mu1 into sin r. Okay. Then since the rays are paraxial, that's our assumption, we can write sin i is approximately equal to i is equal to tan i. We substitute it in terms of tan i. Okay. Now, once we have got this, what we are doing is we just have to find out the value of tan i and mu2 tan i. Again, I am writing down in this large triangle, you can write tan i is equal to x by u is equal to mu1 times x by v. x, x gets cancelled out. You get mu2 by mu1 is equal to what? is equal to u by v, okay? And that is equal to nothing but real depth by apparent depth. Real depth by apparent depth, okay? And all this is being measured from where? From the free surface, from the free surface. So what you get? Mu2 by mu1 is equal to u by v because we can cancel off x and x. So you get real depth by apparent depth. 